Every year, over 4 billion passengers are carried by aircraft across our skies. Air travel has brought the world closer together, but with added risks. However, what hides behind the headlines is in fact the safest form of transport. This is arguably due to the creation of one thing, autopilot. This system has allowed aircraft to fly in adverse weather, land in darkness and navigate in safety. As years go by it becomes more advanced with up to 98% of the average commercial flight being handled by autopilot. Does this replace the job of today's pilots? Well, we will answer that today. Examining the past, present and future of autopilot using computer simulation, real life interviews, historical data and more, I set out to answer the question, will autopilot replace pilots in the future? Lion Air Flight 610 departs from Jakarta Airport on a domestic service, taking off at 6.20am, on time. This state-of-the-art Boeing 737 MAX was recently delivered to the airline and contained many automated systems to allow the pilots to transfer to this type with minimal training. However, after takeoff, problems come quick and fast. Issues with various sensors create conflicting warnings and cause the aircraft to pitch up and down. The pilots battle with the aircraft and once north attempt to turn back to the airport. A war between man and machine, but only one can win. Eventually, despite their best efforts, the plane enters a nosedive. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. Terrain, terrain. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. All 189 people on board die. How did a state-of-the-art airliner crash into the sea just months after being acquired? Surely automated systems should have stopped this exact thing from happening. Corporate corruption, design flaws were all to blame, but the major factor was an automated system designed to help pilots by the name of MCAS. But how did we get to this point? Aviation is safer than it's ever been. Systems such as this are meant to enrich the industry and aid pilots. But occasionally, mistakes are made. Fatal mistakes. The automation of the industry is quite inevitable. But to what extent will it impact aviation? To truly understand this, we need to look back, back into the past. On a more positive note, we move to Paris in the year 1914. Now some context for this very fundamental invention. In 1912, Lawrence Sperry, son of the famous gyro compass co-inventor Elmer Sperry, had invented the quote, gyroscopic stabiliser system, the first iteration of what we now call autopilot. Moving back over to 1914 Paris, this system was shown to the public, sadly days before World War I. A Curtis C2 was used to demonstrate this system in action, with Sperry's son climbing out onto the wing and leaving his device to do the work. By today's standards, this was a relatively simple automated system, based on a single, simple gyroscope. As the pilot let go of the controls, the plane would naturally move. This could either be because of the speed of the aircraft, the adverse effects of wind and weather, 
or vibration. As the gyroscope remained straight and level, this could therefore be transferred to the flight controls. Through a series of motors and wires, although relatively simple by today's standards, this allowed the aircraft to remain straight and level, not going on a crash course, which of course allowed the pilots to let go of the controls and step out onto the wing. Now this is considered to be one of the greatest advancements in aviation since the development of the Wright brothers' first powered aircraft. It allowed for flights in worse weather and greatly improved the safety of the aircraft, and what followed was a great period of development. Growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing ground. During the First and Second War, this system greatly improved. More gyroscopes were added for greater stability, and in some cases, the pilots could tune these gyroscopic systems to make the aircraft fly a certain way using hydraulic servo motors. It was a fantastic tool for military bombers, allowing for greater stability when they were attacking. Over the years, the Sperry Corporation massively grew in size, becoming the market leader. And by 1931, for the first time in history, a commercial airliner flew with the use of autopilot. By this point, nations such as the United Kingdom, Russia and France had started to develop their own systems. However, the grumble of the Second World War soon came along, but this did allow for greater development and the demand for automatic systems skyrocketed. For this part of my research, I spoke to my great uncle who was an avionics engineer in the Royal Air Force joining in 1955. We discussed the development of autopilot during the Second World War and onwards with suction-based autopilots in the Lancaster bomber and Halifax bomber aircraft, for example. I also spoke to the Farnborough Air Sciences Museum Trust, and I managed to secure some photos and explanations of these World War II autopilots. Now on the screen now is the Mark IX automatic pilot. As confusing as it may seem, let's break it down. On the left of this photo we have the standard gyroscope unit which of course provides the stability and on the right we have the pilot control units which allow for their inputs to influence this autopilot system. On the right, of course, we also have the servo motors which carry out the job of the autopilot. Now, the gyroscope unit tells the aircraft about its current state, while the pilots tell the aircraft what they would like the aircraft state to be. This is why we have a junction box in the middle. These signals are then combined and the servos move to bring forward the desired effect. This 1942 system can somewhat control the whole aircraft, a very successful invention. Another development me and my uncle also talked about was the ILS, standing for Instrument Landing System. This is a rather old system that is still in use today, with the standard system being developed in Britain during World War II. Now as complex as it sounds, it uses two simple axes of radio signals. These form a cross section and allow the plane to get on the ground. For context, we have the localizer and glide slope. The glide slope provides vertical navigation. Imagine a tall tower coming out of the runway and the localizer provides horizontal navigation. If you can imagine this giant cross floating in the air, as it leads down towards the runway in a slope, you get the perfect location for the plane in the middle. Now of course, this is a very complex system, but in its most basic form, just imagine two radio waves being transmitted, forming a cross that leads down to the runway. As the pilot or aircraft follows this cross, it allows the pilot to safely land the plane in adverse and low visibility weather conditions. Now, as I said, this system is still in use today, with the first successful fully automated auto land being in the 1960s, which is still quite a while ago. Now, as you can see throughout this section of my research and this film, the fundamentals of autopilot rely on gyroscopes. Both world wars quickened the development of this amazing technology and this led to the gyroscope not being needed as much and slowly the autopilot turned to suction and now electricity based devices. 
but importantly, the fundamentals have remained the same. With just 11 years after the first powered flight, we had the first Sperry autopilot, which was the world's first autopilot. And a few years after that, we had more advanced systems used in the First and Second World War. Years after that, we had the present day systems, which still relied on these war fundamentals. And this effectively leads us on to the present day. Let's talk about this. The time of the jet engine soon approaches, just years after the Second World War. This leads to jet engines being used in commercial aviation, opening up air travel to almost everybody. Pre-coronavirus, over 8 million passengers fly in our skies every day, the size of a small country. Now for us here in England, the most popular routes are often down to sunny Spain, with millions of holidaymakers making the trek down in the summer. Now the most likely aircraft for this trip is the Boeing 737-800. The Boeing 737 is the most successful aircraft family of all time still in production. With the first Boeing 737 having its first flight in 1967 and continuous updates since, it felt only right for me to use this aircraft as my case study to explain present day autopilot. For this segment I examined the autopilot systems in the Boeing 737-800, spoke to a 737 pilot all to answer the question of whether pilots will be replaced. In order to do this, as I stated in my intro, I have to discover about the current relationship between man and machine. Now the 737 family forms a conventional airliner with two powerful engines being able to seat anywhere from roughly 100 to 200 passengers. It uses a standard cable system for its flight controls which means the pilot's inputs are directly conveyed to the aircraft with pulleys and wires as opposed to the modern electrical fly-by-wire system found in competitor Airbus aircraft and newer Boeing aircraft. Now on the screen now we've got the cockpit of the Boeing 737-800 most famously and notably used by Ryanair. Let's break this down so you can get an understanding before we get to the autopilot. Now the throttle is located in the center of the aircraft. This is used to control the speed of the aircraft and can be pulled back and forth. The yokes to the left and right of the throttle are used to control the roll and pitch of the aircraft. See it as a steering wheel that can be used to move the plane up and down. The main screen here is called the primary flight display and it displays critical information to the pilots such as speed, height and angle. Below both of these we've got the rudder pedals which control the yaw of the plane or move the rudder on the back of the aircraft. This can be used to sway the aircraft left or right. And finally the section we will be looking at in detail is located here, it is the MCP or the mode control panel which contains the autopilot. Now this is the Boeing 737-800 autopilot interface, initially made by the Sperry company in previous models with the SP-77 and SP-177. However, successor companies have evolved it over time, but like all things in this video, it has been built on the same fundamentals. On the right side, we have a collection of buttons the top two are the command buttons which make the autopilot take effect, while the bottom two are slightly older systems by the name of control wheel steering. Now you don't need to press both of these buttons for the autopilot to take effect, we've got left and right uh, for the side that the autopilot is going off. Now control wheel steering, the bottom two, uh, in its most basic form is cruise control for the aircraft it automatically maintains the pilot's yoke input. Now on both sides of the MCP we have the flight director switch. This is an ingenious device that shows the desired path for the pilot or autopilot to fly to what match does? the inputs on the MCP. When this is activated a pink cross will appear on the primary flight display. Now the four main inputs are located in the centre of the MCP. Let's break them down. On the left we have the speed selector which uses auto throttle to maintain the desired speed. 
auto throttle can be turned on by this switch and it will, you guessed it, automatically move the throttle without the pilot's input. Next to this we have the heading selector which when turned on via this button below and selected it will automatically make the aircraft fly on a certain compass heading. Next to the heading selector we have altitude selection and vertical speed. These can be used in a variety of ways but the main aim is to get the aircraft to fly to a certain height. Now these systems are relatively old, being introduced in the 1960s and onwards. However, we also have more advanced systems in place that utilise something called a flight management computer, and this can be used to fly a desired flight plan with desired heights and desired speeds. Now these still run off the pilot's inputs into the computer, which entered normally before flight, but essentially once this is all set up, LNAV and VNAV activated on the MCP, you will find that the plane flies itself to a certain degree. And with the flight management computer, you can do a wide variety of things, from tuning radios to selecting approaches. Now, in addition to this, we've also got ILS utilising technology which as discussed in the previous chapter can be used to land the plane in low visibility. Now for this part of my film I spoke to Kudzani, a 737 pilot. He explained to me that the balance in the 737 between pilot and autopilot is well tuned with each helping each other out, overall improving safety but also making the aircraft nice to fly for pilots. He also agreed with me on the fact that even though many parts of the 737's technology is from 50-60 years ago, it is still incredibly trustworthy. So this brings us on to a few questions. If planes in our skies are still flying with 60s technology, what is the point in upgrading and getting rid of pilots? In contrast, if 1960s technology can make a plane almost fly itself with minimum input, what does the future hold? Well, let's explore that in the next chapter. The idea of a plane flying itself to some is a scary one. We the public are naturally worried about self-driving cars for example. So adding another dimension to this automation process is worrying to many people. After all, aircraft are essentially giant metal canisters filled with hundreds of people and highly explosive fuel. So to many, the worry is natural. However, this concept is a possible reality with even today's technology, but the automation of airliners does not mean pilots have to diminish. There are various routes around this, including keeping the current system. Now Airbus states that pilotless aircraft are possible today, but it relies completely on public trust. On top of this, most accidents are caused by human error, so on paper it makes sense to replace pilots with automated systems. But the answer is not black or white, it is very complex. As proved by Alan Turing, computers cannot solve everything, shown by, for example, the Holt Not Holt paradox. Now this is for logic issues and the fact that the automation is always going to rely on a human coding it. On top of this, computers cannot comprehend moral issues such as hijackings or where to crash the aircraft. So where does this lead? As of right now, it would take roughly 20 to 30 years to get pilotless aircraft in the skies on paper. Now this is ignoring legislation and instead focusing on the lifespan of aircraft in our skies now. Now the spectrum of automated aircraft is a wider one, stretching from full automation with no pilots in there to the current system. Going through the options I explored, in my opinion the most likely options are single pilot operations or ground based controllers. Now with single pilot operations you have one pilot in the cockpit and the rest is mostly automated. This keeps the human aspect but also removes the need for expensive pilots. With the ground based controller you've got a pilot on the ground that is watching over a collection of fully automated planes ready to take over at any time. These are most likely being investigated at the present by manufacturers and airlines, so we can expect to see these sort of prototypes within the next 30 years. It is undeniable that more automation would make the industry safer, as the majority of accidents are caused by human error. 
but as stated above, automation cannot solve moral issues or even some logical issues. This makes semi-pilotless aircraft or fully automated aircraft more vulnerable to the actions of hijackers than our current planes. In addition, there will always be human programmers, and they will make mistakes even with the automated systems, as shown with the 737 MAX. However, overall this shows that despite the potential issues, automation can occur, and pilots can be replaced, but will the public trust them? The short answer is yes, but the long answer is complicated. On the screen now we have the product adoption curve. This is normally used to show how consumers will react to new technology. However, we can apply it to pilotless aircraft, albeit this topic being much more controversial. As of right now, we're just on the tip of the left of the graph. Some tech firms and manufacturers are experimenting with pilotless aircraft or ground controlled planes. Now of course we have unmanned military drones so pilotless aircraft are not a new concept but pilotless aircraft with passengers are. From this point on it can go two ways, it can be adopted and within the next 100 years will become a secure reality or like driverless cars at the moment it could become a fad. Let's look at the human reaction to current automated transport systems. Take the Docklands Light Railway in London, one of the most effective transport systems on the planet. Public response to it is overwhelmingly positive, and it is an efficient service. However, it is constantly monitored by humans and, of course, the marshal on board being able to take over. It's also not without its automated accidents. In closer comparison, let's look at the response from the public on driverless cars. It is marginally negative, and they haven't hooked on yet. As shown by the product adoption curve, it takes time, but in the future, it is likely that driverless cars will become a reality. Once again, I spoke to two commercial pilots on this issue and they agreed that the automation of airliners can occur, but for it to take off, well, it relies on public trust and for the foreseeable future that will not happen. Now linking this back to the past, we can look to the development of another automated system, the elevator or lift as we call them. Initially, they were human controlled in the early 20th century, but of course were eventually automated. It took just under 50 years for automated elevators to be commonplace, and obviously airlines are much different, but the concept remains the same. Humans like to be in control. It is a natural instinct, so anything outside of your circle of influence feels unnatural, concerning, and frankly scary. Let me ask you, if you were to step into a plane tomorrow and you saw no pilots on board, would you feel safe or would you prefer a human in control? It is a difficult question to answer. On paper, many of us, including me, say yes. But as always, unpredictable events can cause tragedy, of which automation cannot always be prepared for, and only a critically thinking human can be. It also adds a whole new barrage of issues such as dependency on technology and the issue of hacking. However, over the next few years, these issues should be resolved, meaning one thing. Can automated airliners occur? Yes. Will automation occur? Well, more than likely. Will pilots be replaced? Yes, they will be in one way or another.